are going to be taking place right before the Phantom Menace when Maul is recruited by Palpatine. So here's a couple things you need to know before we get into this video. Plagueis wanted to get rid of the Rule of Two. Obviously, Plagueis knew about Maul, but Maul was only meant to be an assassin, nothing more. Palpatine trained Maul as an apprentice though, and Maul was never made aware of Plagueis' existence. Palpatine mentions to Plagueis how a Night Sister gave him a child, one of two, and the Night Sister was afraid the child would fall into the clutches of Mother Talzin. Later down the line in the Clone Wars, Maul's twin, Savage Arbrez, would be recruited by Asajj Ventress, Dooku's former assassin, to help and kill Count Dooku. Now, here's where our story begins. Darth Sidious implores with his master to add Sith assassins to their ranks. Plagueis agrees, but he reminds Palpatine that they are not to be apprentices and that no one is to be higher than him or you. Palpatine would agree and sets off to the cursed world of Dathomir. When Sidious arrives, he's greeted by a night sister. Can you help me? Sidious snarls. I've come for children of the Force, not some impractical quest. The night sister responds. Come quickly. The two walk under the brush of the poisonous landscape and find themselves at a bush where two Zabrak children await. Both children are force sensitive, Palpatine states. She responds, yes, quickly take them, before mother takes them away from me. Their names are Savage and Maul. Please take care of them. The children responds, I don't want Tavson to be aware of this encounter. See to it that she doesn't find out. Palpatine returns to his vessel and leaves with Maul and Savage. Now, Palpatine in Son of Dalthamir is a comic shows that he fears Mother Talzin, and this is because she could disrupt his plans. She was able to attack Dooku from across the galaxy. Now at this point, Palpatine could be completely unaware of the situation, but he does want to stay safe in this situation because he's trying to overthrow Plagueis at some point. Upon Palpatine's return, he would keep Savage hidden. He wanted his master to believe that there was only one assassin, Maul. Palpatine knew that Plagueis was smart, but at this point, he was studying the Force extensively. Now Plagueis was incredibly interested in the Force. He studied it all the time. He actually used the Force to feed himself, to keep himself alive, so he could study the Force 24-7. Now Plagueis wanted to forge a dyad with Sidious, and he'd been studying immortality, especially, and you hear a lot of this in the Clone Wars, Phantom Menace, and especially, do you ever hear the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise? Now, at the same time this is happening, Palpatine was training Maul and Savage to become as powerful as they could become. Neither would be a match for their master, but Savage would grow into a f brute force. He would wield a dual-bladed lightsaber as he does in canon, and so would Maul. Savage would be more powerful than his canon adaptation. They'd be about the same power as Maul was in The Phantom Menace. Now, as Palpatine enters the Senate, he would send his quote-unquote assassin, in other words, both assassins, to Naboo to capture the young Queen Amidala, so that the Trade Federation's invasion of Naboo would be seen as a legitimate threat to the Republic. As the chase leads from Naboo to Tatooine, Savage and Maul encounter Jin, and they also see a powerful child that accompanies him. They escape. Savage and Maul return to their master, who in a short time will be killing his master, Plagueis. They tell Palpatine about the child, and Palpatine orders them to capture the child along with the queen. Now everything plays out where the Jedi are made aware of Maul and Savage, and they also meet Anakin and Skywalker. Now, in this theory, the Jedi assume that Maul and Savage are the master and apprentice. They assume that they're the only two Sith, the ones that have been hiding for so long. So the Jedi return to Naboo, Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon. The events play out as normal, Anakin takes a starfighter off to fight off the Lucre Hawk and Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi face down Maul and Savage. The two overpower the Jedi. Savage lands a killing blow to Kenobi, and Maul strikes swiftly as Jin sees his apprentice fall to the floor. Maul and Savage separate. Savage is to capture the Queen of Naboo and free Newt Gunray, and Maul is to await for the child to return. Savage clears the throne room and releases Newt Gunray, 
as he captures the queen. They make their way to their ship. Skywalker returns with pilots and they find the Jedi dead. Maul approaches and quickly dispatches the pilots. Anakin yells, what did you do to my friends? A massive wave of force flies from the and throws Maul across the room. Maul tells the young child that his master will have use for you, and he grabs Skywalker who has been weakened. Now, I want to disclaim to you that this is kind of a situation, kind of like what you see in The Mandalorian, where Grogu isn't really capable of understanding a whole lot, but he's, he's able to use the force in mysterious ways. In the same case, Anakin would be able to use the force to defend himself, I believe, in the situation just by happen chance, by accident, something that would happen by accident that he wouldn't be aware of his power of doing it. He would just be drained by it because he doesn't know how to harness it correctly, right? So he'd be very weak from this, and Maul would just be able to grab him and take him away. Maul and Savage depart, and even though the Lucre Hawk has been destroyed, the Trade Federation would return with more ships. Obviously, if you've seen the Phantom Menace, you've seen the massive fleet that they had outside Naboo. They would come back and slaughter the Gungans who put up a stiff resistance and they would hold the Naboo people as prisoner. The Trade Federation would become recognized as a true power against the Republic. And the Chancellor, newly appointed Palpatine, Sheev Palpatine, would have just finished killing his master Plagueis. <laughs> Palpatine, Savage, and Maul would meet in the secret outpost out in the industrial sector in Coruscant. Padme would be held with Anakin. She would be forced to recognize the Trade Federation as a power regime. The Sith would also notice that Anakin formed an attachment with Padme. They would notice that the two of them had a special bond, and they would kill her to fuel Anakin's raid. Palpatine was aware of Anakin's power and wanted to train him to become the most powerful Sith ever. Palpatine didn't care for the rule of two in this theory, so I want that to be very abundantly clear if you haven't figured that out already. Palpatine's kind of over the rule of two. He's like, I got a bunch of apprentices that are really cool, but I also got this kid right here that's gonna, you know, be more powerful than anything, even me. And he's kind of aware of that. He's gonna be aware that Anakin's probably going to secede him at some point, and the other Sith are gonna have to look up to them because they're not gonna be able to take him down. Anyways, sooner or later, Anakin would grow in his power, and the former Jedi, Dooku, would join the Sith as Lord Tyrannus. The Jedi would remain ignorant they would search the galaxy for the Sith and the Chosen One who they had lost, but they would never be found. They feared that the Chosen One had been taken by the Sith and that he would be trained by the Sith, but they would never find him. The Jedi would also be ignorant of a clone army that had been produced on Kamino that had been prepared by Jedi Master sifo and Lord Tyrannus. The Separatists would grow in strength. They obviously still hold Naboo and Naboo is part of the Separatist movement now. Dooku would become political as he does in canon, and Maul and Savage would continue to train daily. They would also train with Skywalker, but sooner or later, young Skywalker would be more powerful than both of them combined. By the time of Attack of the Clones, Padme is dead, Palpatine is Chancellor, Dooku is a political figure, Maul and Savage are weaker than Anakin Skywalker, and the Jedi haven't found the Sith or Kamino. The Senate would be in panic. The CIS is growing an army, a droid army, bigger than the, anything the galaxy has ever seen. The Republic had nothing. Palpatine would recommend a clone army and suggest that he had discovered cloners through chance. Now obviously this isn't true. Palpatine just wants the clones to be a part of his grand scheme for the Jedi Purge. So he's going to be playing the Senate and saying, oh I found these cloners by chance. I just happened to hear about them. and." We're going to reach out to them for a clone army. A Jedi would be dispatched and discover a massive army that would return to the core to defend it. The droid army on Geonosis, by the way, would be unheard of. Jango would have never been killed, and the Clone Wars would begin. And here's some more information regarding the Clone Wars. Maul, Savage, Anakin, Grievous, Dooku, and Ventress would be regarded as generals in the Separatist army. And Palpatine would become more powerful. There would be more emergency power given to him. The Jedi are in peril. The council members are sent to face down Sith with their clone armies. Windu leads an assault on Ryloth, where he encounters Skywalker for the first time. Windu is unaware that the Chosen One has become Vader, and they begin a duel. The two lock blades in a fierce duel. Anakin is outmatched, but he retreats as destroyers approach. Droidicas cover him as the Master of the Order 
has to focus on the destroyer droids. The Jedi would lose a lot more battles in this situation. In canon, they won a lot, but in this situation, they would lose a lot. And a lot of people would be unaware of the Sith presence. The Sith would be hidden. Anakin, Savage, Maul, they would all be hidden. Grievous, on the other hand, would not be. Grievous would be a widely known figure of tyranny in the Republic. He would be feared by many, and he would create a lot of fear out in the outer worlds, in the outer rim, out across the galaxy as he conquered systems. Now, Ahsoka, Master Windu, and Master Plo, who was in this situation, Ahsoka's master, would become heroes of the Republic. They would be regarded as the Republic's heroes. They would become the poster boy, much like Anakin. As the Republic loses ground faster and faster, the Jedi lose support from the Republic. Palpatine gets more emergency power, and Maul and Savage encounter Ahsoka and Plo during the second battle of Felucia. Maul feared Plo, and this is very true in canon. He was very afraid of Plo, so he stayed steady. In this fight against Plo, he decided to stay steady instead of being out maneuvering and, you know, doing what he does. On the other hand, Savage would be overpowering compared to Ahsoka. And in this theory, Maul and Savage would do this a lot. When they found a duo of Jedi, Savage would take the weaker Jedi, while Maul would take the stronger one, because the weaker Jedi would be overpowered and outmatched by Savage, and the other Jedi wouldn't be able to do anything about it. It's exactly how they killed Obi-Wan and Qui-Gon Jinn in this situation, so they're going to utilize this strategy a lot. In this situation though, Plo would see that Ahsoka is faltering, and yell for her to stand back and get reinforcements. Plo would handle the two Sith well. He would struggle with Savage, and the way I see this battle is a lot like Obi-Wan Kenobi after Adi Galia's death in the Clone Wars. Ahsoka would return with clones and Master Eve Koth. The Sith would run. As they were running though, Plo would take Savage's arm off during their retreat. The two Sith would return to Palpatine defeated, and Palpatine would shoot a wave of electricity towards Savage. Maul would watch silently. Do not fail me again, Savage. Savage would say yes, master. Elsewhere, Dooku and Skywalker are sparring. They would do this a lot. Anakin wanted to be the best, and Dooku was the best duelist that Palpatine had available on the daily. Anakin was fierce and ferocious. He was harnessing all that dark side power that you see from him in the, in the canon. You see him harnessing everything that he tried to push away. He's incredibly powerful and he disarms the Count. And he holds his blade to Count Dooku's neck. Dooku praises Skywalker. Anakin sheathes his weapon and he grins. Palpatine shows up on a hologram. He requests them to go to Felucia to destroy Jedi that are currently there. A droid invasion force arrives and they cut through the Republic defense fleet. Dooku and Anakin arrive behind legions of droids, and the wolf pack is pushed back, and the three Jedi cover their men as they retreat. The Republic is in full retreat in the situation. The droid tanks are stopped, unable to pass through the bush. The two Sith step forward in front of their army. They stand before an army of clankers. Plo, Koth, and Ahsoka step from the brush as their clones move to a more defensible position. Koth would tell the Sith that it would end here. The Jedi would stand defensively as Anakin stepped forward, arrogantly. Face me. Koth and Ahsoka would flank Skywalker as Plo would lock blades with Dooku. Skywalker would send a wave of lightning at Ahsoka as she tried to flank him, hitting her and sending her into a tree. Eth, Koth, and Anakin Skywalker would get into a heated duel, but the council member was no match for Anakin. Eth is struck down by Vader, and he makes his way to Ahsoka, who is still on the ground. Vader lifts his lightsaber and is hit with electric judgment from behind as Plo returns to parry Dooku, who tries to strike him down. Anakin, enraged, gets up to meet Ahsoka, who is trying to strike him down while he was getting up. Anakin grabs her saber hand and lifts her up and then plunges his saber into her. Ahsoka falls lifelessly to the ground. Anakin turns to Plo, who sees his apprentice fall lifeless. He pulls her lightsaber and ignites it. He tells Wolf through communications to prep the gunships and Plo struggles between Dooku and Anakin. Dooku doesn't want to kill Plo, because Plo is a former friend, but Skywalker, his anger grows every strike he swings. Gunships can be heard over the duel, 
of flashing blades. Plo lands a cut on Skywalker's shoulder. Nothing serious, but enough to make him angrier. Gunships come across the horizon, guns ablaze, to save their Jedi general, the one that remains. And Anakin pulls the two gunships together, colliding them to a fiery blaze. Another gunship lands, and Wolf and some clones run out to save Plo, and Plo knows that those clones will die. He sends a force wave towards them to save them, and they are sent back to their ship, and Plo is struck down by Vader, and the clones retreat. Anakin stands as victor, and Dooku looks at the dead Jedi. He sees that Skywalker is truly powerful, and Anakin calls Sidious, and he tells him of their victory over the three Jedi, two of which were council members. The CIS pushes the Republic to the brink. The Jedi struggle to hold on to any fronts, and with Maul, Savage, Anakin, Dooku, Grievous, and Ventress hunting Jedi, the Republic was on its heels. With the Jedi so weak, Palpatine decides the clones could effectively take out the Jedi. And in this situation, Palpatine would remove the Jedi from ranking. Now you could say Tarkin does this or anything, um, but essentially what I'm going for here is that Palpatine would say that the Jedi are ineffective generals. They've lost every battle in the war. They've, they've not won any grand battles. They may have won skirmishes, but they've not won systems. And the Jedi are faltering, they're dying, they're being killed off, and no one knows how they're being killed off so easily. Obviously, people aren't aware of the Sith yet. And the few that have seen the Sith are Wolf and those few clones that survive. And they've only seen Dooku and Anakin. So in this scenario, Palpatine is removing the Jedi from power. The Jedi are just sitting in the temple now. The Jedi can't do anything. So, Palpatine uses this moment to execute Order 66. Before though, he orders Anakin, Maul, and Savage to Coruscant. General Grievous follows. They are told to sneak in to the Jedi Temple. So, the Jedi in this situation are down. In canon, they have about 10,000 Jedi at the time of the Clone Wars. In this canon, in this theory, they have about 5,000 Jedi because the number of Sith is much more than it is in canon. And Anakin, Maul, and Savage are killing Jedi across the galaxy. The Jedi are no longer afraid of just Grievous, they're afraid of whoever's killing the Jedi. They're not winning battles, the clones are being massacred, and the Jedi are being killed just as much. Palpatine sends Anakin, Maul, Savage, and Grievous to deal with the council members that currently reside on Coruscant, while the clones dispatch the weaker Jedi. And Palpatine tells Commander Fox of the Coruscant Guard that those who wield crimson sabers are not enemies, but heroes of the Republic. Do not strike them down. Palpatine wants to see the Republic losing because of the Jedi, because of their arrogance, showing that the Republic would succeed with his Sith apprentices. Dooku and Grievous were the only ones that were really in the public eye. The Sith were never noticed other than like I said, Wolf and those few clones that saw Anakin and Dooku. The band of Sith would sneak into the Jedi Temple and await for the council members. Order 66 has been ordered, and the clones break through the temple security and begin shredding the Jedi. The council was put on high alert as the Jedi Temple goes into a fire and blaze of fire and death and destruction as clones kill Jedi and Jedi kill clones. The remaining council members, those who remain, come to the aid of their brothers and sisters. Caught off guard though, Fisto, Shock T, and Sassy Tin are struck down by Maul, Savage, and Anakin. They are jumped from the corridors. They didn't expect it. They didn't see it. General Grievous, on the other hand, sneaks off and goes on a rampage of his own. He's killing clones and Jedi. He's having a fun time. He's, he's doing his thing. You know how Grievous is. Anakin engages with Windu again, while Maul and Savage get into a duel with the Grand Master. Yoda. Anakin snarls over his power. My power has doubled since the last we met, while Mace stands his ground without saying a word. Yoda quickly puts Savage off balance, but his brother covers him. Yoda jumps from wall to wall, and Anakin can hear it in his ears and sends a wave of the Force. Mace cries out, Master, no! Anakin turns around and swings ferociously into Master Windu's blade. Yoda is grabbed by the Force by the wall and Savage tries to stab Yoda, when Kiadi Mundi stabs Savage in the back. Maul is in rage and shouts his brother's name, and Maul begins to duel both Mundi and Yoda. Anakin, on the other hand, pulls Savage's weapon to his side and ignites it. He pushes Master Windu into a corner, and before he can land a finishing blow, Master Yoda sends him into a fight. Skywalker! Betrayed us, you did. You left me no choice. You abandoned me. And now you will pay. 
and it can lift Master Windu, Mundi, and Yoda. He snaps all their necks simultaneously, and they all drop lifelessly to the ground. Anakin drops Savage's lightsaber near him, who is still breathing. Anakin leaves to kill more Jedi. Maul tends to his brother, who is still alive. Anakin is fueled by the killing as he strikes down Jedi and incinerates others with bolts of lightning and fury. Anakin enters a room. He heard crying, whimpering. The Jedi younglings. As Anakin enters, he sees them and says, Come out. It's okay, young ones. Those who join will live. The rest will not. One steps forward and says, We are Jedi. I am not a shower of lightning cuts through. The boy, dropping him. Stand with him. Most of the younglings run to him. All but one. So you choose death. The youngling struggles, but one of the boys... Tell Skywalker, Grogu can't walk. Maul storms in with Savage after giving him some Bacta. Savage is being healed slowly, but the Bacta will take time to kick in. Stay here. We have a Sith army being formed. Keep these younglings safe from Grievous. I'll hunt for more Jedi. Anakin leaves. Small is surprised that Anakin thinks he can give him orders, but he's willing to oblige. Anakin encounters a temple guard by the name of Pa'un, the Jedi Knight, new. It was all falling apart and asked for a way out. Anakin muttered, kill the Jedi. The night ended. Dead Jedi is strewn across the temple. Clone Commander Fox, who was told not to kill the crimson wielding Jedi, didn't touch him. But they are now heroes of the Republic. Grievous evacuates the scene first. He kills a bunch of Jedi, but he evacuates first knowing that the clones will target him next. Savage, who is still weakened, and Maul leave as Anakin, Paun, and the younglings follow. Chancellor approaches the Senate. With the death of the Jedi, we can advance our war effort towards victory. The CIS would shut down its droid factories. Grievous and Dooku would become shadows as the Sith would begin to have inner fighting, especially between Anakin and Maul and Savage. Maul and Savage, they were intimidated by young Skywalker because they watched him kill three council members at once, and two of them being the most powerful in the Order, Master Yoda and Master Windu. Grievous, on the other hand, wanted power. He just wanted power. Dooku, having done his part, would become an advisor. He would become more like a master, and he would actually fill the role much like Yoda did. He would become a mentor for the younglings, which I think is some way ironic. I think that was kind of ironic. I didn't intend for that, but it kind of came out really cool. Pa'un would become the Grand Inquisitor as you see in Star Wars Rebels and seek guidance from Dooku when he needed help training his Inquisitors. Palpatine would turn the Republic into the Empire. And before I go any further, the reason this would work even better than it does in canon is because in canon, the Republic feared the outcome of what would happen if they were left under the control of someone like Grievous because they saw Grievous and the Separatists as a force that would inhabit people and enslave them and torture them and genocide them and take away all their supplies so they saw that as fear in this scenario where the cis has more control and wins more battles that would be even greater so moving the republic into an empire would make more sense for a lot of the senators in the republic and a lot of the people of the republic would agree with it and they'd be more willing to agree with it as well grievous would be sent to genosis where he would contemplate a droid rebellion Maul and Savage would consider killing Anakin, but they wouldn't, out of fear of killing Sidious' favorite apprentice. The Jedi have been wiped out, and tyranny would thrive until someone would bring balance to the Force.
Anakin Skywalker has killed thousands of Jedi. He retires to his hidden moon base where he meditates. Skywalker is allies across the Galactic Empire. Many are loyal to him out of fear, but others are loyal for their want to seize power. Skywalker has taken fallen Jedi into his ranks as apprentices. Barriss Sophie, a notable one, is his prized apprentice. Alarms sound from Lord Vader's chambers, and an Imperial officer beckons the Dark Lord. A Jedi has been discovered, my lord. They request to face you. Vader's eyes open, and he rises to his feet. I'll be there, raising a cloak over his head, only revealing golden eyes. Vader's personal shuttle departs for the planet Bathawa, where the Jedi claims to be. Vader's shuttle lands, and he walks out flanked by his Imperial Guard, followed closely by his prized apprentice Barris. A large Belsic male walks towards Vader and kneels, saying, He lives to serve the Dark Lord. Vader asks for a name, and the name given is Pong Krell. Vader sees potential in Krell, but decides for his entertainment that Pong must best his apprentice in battle. Though Anakin was a fair master to Barris, he did want to see his power shine from her. The duel commenced. Green and blue clashed with the red that shined from Barris's blades. The duel wouldn't be quick. It would be hard fought. Barris was much smaller and weaker than Krell, but her usage of the dark side made her a formidable opponent. Anakin, bored of the stalemate duel, used the force to stop both of them in their tracks, telling Pong that he may join his ranks. Barris kneeled before her master and apologized. Skywalker placed his hand on her shoulder, saying, You did well. Pong is much larger and stronger. You will best him another day. You must keep at your training if you don't want to be replaced. The shuttle would be boarded, and the ship would be taken back to Vader's secret moon base. Vader would greet the Grand Inquisitor, and request that he go back to the planet Korriban to continue the training of the Inquisitors. The Grand Inquisitor would nod and return to Korriban. Skywalker had saved the Jedi younglings two years ago, and they were being grown into Skywalker's loyal army of the future Sith. Pong congratulated his new master on the accomplishment. Skywalker nodded and headed towards the command bridge on his secret moon base. There he would meet Director Krennic, the director of the Imperial Military Department of Advanced Weapons Research, he was fiercely loyal to Vader. Though Palpatine was the Emperor, he was becoming less and less powerful than Vader every second. People saw Vader, who rarely appeared on Coruscant, as the future face of the Empire. Tarkin and Grand Admiral Thrawn were fiercely loyal to the Emperor, and Vader knew this, so he played into their game, until they would become loyal to him, or die. Krennic informed Vader that their project was nearing completion, and that it was hidden securely from the Imperial government and hierarchy. Vader would pull from his side a hollow emitter that showed the Death Star. He had stolen it years prior, when he was his master's apprentice. He kept it safe. He knew his master was unaware because he had crafted a similar hollow emitter that was missing details his master would never notice. On Coruscant, the Emperor called Maul and Savage to his office to request them to go to Geonosis and check on Dooku and Grievous. They have cut off communication with the Empire. I want you to see if they are still loyal to our cause. Take the 212th Legion with you, in case they have become turncoats. The two Sith would nod and leave the room. Sidious would tell Thrawn, I have felt a disturbance in the Force. We must secure any loose ends in the galaxy before we build the Death Star. Thrawn would agree, and Moff Tarkin would request to show the Emperor his Dark Trooper project that was coming along efficiently. On the relatively peaceful planet of Lothal across the galaxy, a small force of Jedi were building. They had taken refuge in the Jedi Temple located on the planet. Some notable Jedi that were reorganizing the Lost Order were Kanan Jars, who was barely old enough to be a knight, Ram Koda, Kyle Katarn, and the ever-so-arrogant Quinlan Vos. They were no more than 30 Jedi old enough to swing a lightsaber, and one of the locals named Ezra was at the top of his class of Jedi being trained. The Jedi were in building, but in fear. Voss decided that the Jedi needed to make a move, now. Voss, after fighting with Ram Koda, who was the closest thing to a Grand Master, ran off to Dathomir to consult the witches that were known to frequent that area. He wanted to bring them to the side of the Jedi. Dooku on Geonosis, though, would send his apprentice Ventress off to Dathomir to ask her brethren for assistance in taking out the Sith so that they could secure their rule. The past two years have been miserable for the Count and for Grievous. They've been training to kill the Emperor and his apprentices. 
unaware that a Sith army was being raised on the former homeworld of the Sith, Korriban. The largest droid army ever seen in galactic history was being forged on Geonosis, larger than what the CIS had during the Clone Wars, though the two noticed a ship landing near one of the droid foundries. Two brothers emerged. Dooku would approach, unbeknownst to him, that there was an Imperial fleet over Genosis. Dooku would propose to the brothers to join him, that there was an army here large enough to conquer the entire galaxy that could overthrow the Emperor and rule the galaxy together. Grievous was hungry though for a kill, and was hidden up above without Dooku's knowledge. The brothers contemplated for a moment, and then decided that no army could stop the Emperor and swore their loyalty to him. Before a blade could swing or be ignited, Grievous dropped from the sky, shredding Savage apart with his feet and igniting blades into his chest. Maul jumped back, igniting his blades, rage in his eyes. He knew he was no match for both of them. He looked for an escape. He tapped a beacon on his wrist, and an Imperial invasion rained down from the sky. Maul laughed and swung at Grievous. Gunship after gunship came down from the sky, and an Imperial gunship found its way towards the duel. The ship landed and several purge troopers ran out and surrounded General Grievous. Dooku called into the Genosian Hive to Poggle the Lesser and told him to release the battle droids. A massive battle ensued. The 212th was more skilled, but the number of battle droids and Genosians was too much. The duel between Dooku and Maul was decided by a blow to Maul's left arm that left him in a defensive position. While Grievous fended off purge trooper after purge trooper, laughing as he slaughtered them, Dooku and Grievous then cornered Maul and made him yield. Dooku brought Maul into the communication center to show him off to Palpatine. Grievous led the counteroffensive on the clone army, which was being decimated. Bombing runs came, but there were millions of droids, held since the days of the Clone Wars, that were overrunning the continuously weakened 212. Commander Cody fought with his men, and they didn't relay a surrender. While the Imperial fleet was stable and keeping the Imperial troops on the ground safe, the resistance was overbearing for the entirety of the Imperial forces. Tarkin, who was in the bridge of one of the brand new Imperial One Star Destroyers, called back to Coruscant and requested reinforcements. Palpatine promised that a fleet from Kamino was on the way. Dooku would call Palpatine's office, and Palpatine would be furious with his apprentice, both current and former. Maul would apologize, and Dooku would grin as he removed Maul's head with a stroke. Dooku spoke quickly and told Palpatine that revenge would be his, but before he could quickly end the call, every Genosian in the room and the Count were lifted by force by Palpatine. Palpatine was strong in the force, and he snapped each and every single one of the necks. Turning to the Grand Admiral, Thrawn, We must crush this droid rebellion. I do not want a single bug left alive on the planet. Thrawn knew what this meant, and deported with a strike force to assist Grand Moff Tarkin and the Imperial fleet from Kamino. Anakin felt from his meditation chamber that a battle was ensuing on Genosius, and that both of the Emperor's dogs were there. Vader knew he could seize the moment, but decided he didn't want to. Instead, he had studies to go to. He remembered his master talking about the power that Plagueis had and how he could create life, but also prevent death. Skywalker believed that if he could create more Force users, that he could build a Sith army loyal to him and him alone. Anakin didn't care much for the galaxy. He had other plans for them, but he wanted to focus on becoming the most powerful Force user the galaxy had ever seen. He was already more powerful than the Emperor, and was the most powerful being in the galaxy, but he wanted more power from the Force. Vader requested that his apprentices stay on the moon and train the younglings and spar with one another. He would return from Korriban eventually. Quinlan Voss landed on the red world of Dathomir. He walked towards the Witch Temple, but before he could enter he was surrounded by the witches that inhabited the planet. Then a ship landed next to his. It was Ventress. Mother Talzin stepped out, and with a single hand gesture, her sisters backed away. Ventress realized she found a Jedi. The two would lock eyes, each igniting their blades. They clashed in battle, an even display of combatants. They taunted each other until a message was relayed from Poggle the Lesser to Asajj. She was told that her master was dead and that she needed to return to Genosis. She forced Push Boss back and sheathed her sabers and yielded. She ended Poggle's transmission and decided that she would no longer serve others. She told Voss she didn't want to fight and returned to her fighter and left. Voss, though, was enamored by her and decided to follow her in his ship. 
Admiral Thrawn's fleet emerged from hyperspace. Tarkin was surprised with the extra reinforcements he had received from the Corps. Tarkin knew that there was no great threat to the Empire, but the Corps was severely undefended so that the Empire could deal with a bunch of bugs on Geonosis. Tarkin called down to Commander Cody and informed him that it was time to leave. Cody rounded up his men and prepared them for evacuation back to the Imperial fleet above. Gunships returned to the surface under fighter cover and picked up all the men, both from Camino and the 212th. All clone troopers were off the surface, and all vehicles followed. Seconds after the last LAAT left the ground, a wave of TIE bombers left the hangars of several Venator-class Star Destroyers above. The first wave of bombers shredded droid foundries in the Genosian hives. After the bombers pulled up the surface, Thrawn and Tarkin ordered all ships to open fire on the surface of Genosis. Genosians and droids were obliterated as the surface crumbled under heavy fire. Another wave of TIE bombers left the already ruined surface in shambles as they returned to their ships. Down to the surface came probe droids and KX enforcer droids to exterminate the remaining Genosians, droid forces, and the ever-elusive General Grievous. Though the bombardment killed most of anything on the surface and even the catacombs, the KX and probe droids killed everything else. Still without sight of General Grievous. Anakin landed on the almost desolate surface of Korban and met with the Grand Inquisitor who reported ever so proudly of the training his Inquisitors have accomplished. The Nine Sister, a towering Inquisitor, was brainwashed by Maul and Savage into thinking that Anakin was going to slaughter them when he arrived. And she stepped out in front of her brethren and told Anakin that Maul and Savage told her that Anakin was going to try and kill anyone who threatened his power. Anakin whipped his head around and saw the Inquisitor stand in almost attack position. He spoke softly. You are in no danger, but if you believe you can best me, then try. She ignited her blade and ran towards Skywalker. Anakin faced the Ninth Sister, and with a wave of his fingers, she flew across the landscape into an ancient Sith pillar. She rose from the rebel with hatred in her eyes and in a rage-filled spirit. She ran towards Skywalker. Vader was amused and from beneath his cloak, he raised his hand ever so elegantly. The Nine Sister was stopped in her tracks, frozen in time. He grinned. You were in no danger. If you ever believe the word of fallen Sith traitors to the Empire, you will be slain by me. She whimpered and fell on her face as he released her. Anakin turned to the Grand Inquisitor. As for you, I'd be more careful of who you allow to interact with your trainees. Though the Empire's dogs are dead, everyone one's power. The Grand Inquisitor would nod, and Vader would go into the Sith Temple. He would kneel before the tomb of the Lord of Hunger, Nihilus. Vader wanted to learn how to drain life from his enemies. He knew how to snap necks, crumble buildings, electrocute armies, and pull ships from the skies, but he sought knowledge of Lord Nihilus before he looked for Plagueis' studies. Vader sits idle in his quarters on Coruscant. He's learned the little information he can grab from his master regarding Plagueis. And though he has been using the Sith Holocron as apprentice Barriss helped him find, he seeks more information regarding the dark side of the Force. Anakin has trained Barriss and Krell well, and their essence is hidden from the Emperor on the Death Star. Director Krennic has already informed Lord Vader that the project is complete. The Emperor, sensing a ripple in the galaxy, has requested all of his top Imperials to Coruscant. All the Inquisitors, Thrawn, Tarkin, Veers, Krennic, they were all present. The Emperor's paranoia about the movement in the Force has made those closest to him question their loyalty. Vader's presence on Coruscant is seen as an immense power. Vader feels it and knows it. 
The Emperor knows that Vader is the most powerful being in the galaxy, and is trying to ensure his cloning program is ready for him to be brought back in case he is killed by his apprentice. The Emperor calls Lord Vader from his quarters and requests that he meets with the other Imperial high-ranking members. Vader nods and makes movement for his master's office, surrounded by elite guard. Vader enters, and the room looks toward his momentous presence. Vader quietly makes his way to a seat normally designated to him, and seats himself. Air can be felt returning to the room as Vader settles in. The Emperor announces that the Empire will push forward with its new Dark Trooper program, and recruiting civilians from across the galaxy to be troopers in the Empire. The Empire will be renouncing the cloning program and abandoning the Jango Fett Gino, and that would be for other possibilities with the Kaminoans, so they're replacing the Jango Fett Gino for other possibilities. Across the galaxy and the planet Lethal, rebel forces have mounted a small force of combatants that are supported by the Imperial Senator Bail Organa and Mon Mothma. Their strike force could kill the Emperor, though the Jedi fear that direct confrontation could ruin the Jedi and any attempt to resurrect their ruined order. Grandmaster Coda believes in taking the fight to the Empire, but when the rebels have a strong enough task force. While Saw Gerrera throws insults at the Grand Master, debacle ensues yet again between the puny rebel force. The rebels don't have an established leader, and most of them are too far afraid to confront the ever so arrogant Gerrera. Saw decides that enough is enough and takes his band of loyal troops and prepares to strike at Imperials and try to gain attention from the overbearing Empire. Coda turns to the remaining members of the Rebel Council and tells them they need a fleet a fleet that can resist the newly built Imperial One Star Destroyers. Coda also says they need to be wary of what Guerreras does because of what spies have reported to what happened on Genosis. The Rebels are falling apart before they can even get started at saving the galaxy. Back on Coruscant, after a much more lighthearted discussion regarding the Imperial Army, Vader takes a gunship with the Grand Inquisitor to the former Jedi Temple. Normally, Vader needed it to be requested in order to go to the temple, but his impatience has made him decide that it was time to venture inside the temple. Vader knew that the Sith had been on Coruscant before the Jedi, and that the Jedi Temple was built over the Siths. He sought information regardless of what his master wanted him to know. Vader, though, also wanted the Grand Inquisitor to use the information to teach his students. Vader wanted the Sith to be unstoppable. Vader and the Grand Inquisitor spent hours in the Sith Remnants, but Vader's stance changed when he felt a disturbance in the Force. He rose to his feet as his master arrived. Lord Vader, I did not permit you access to the Sith Temple. What are you doing here? Vader turns ever so slightly and mutters, I'm learning about the dark side. There's information I know you're not telling me about, the Force. Why? The Emperor steps forward to place a hand on his apprentice. My friend. The nature of the dark side is not to be absorbed all at once. You will gain your power, but... A red blade ignited from Vader's hand. Are you challenging me, Lord Vader? Anakin's eyes shot yellow daggers. I want to learn these powers, and I will not be stopped. Sidious looked at the Grand Inquisitor, telling him, Leave us. With a nod, he left. You know, Lord Vader, I killed my master in sleep. But I learned everything from him. You merely scratched the surface of what you could harbor from me. If you kill me, you have nothing to gain. Vader was silent. Then he spoke. Show me the nature of the dark side. Sidious whips around, sending the most powerful wave of force lightning he can towards Vader, shocking him and sending him backwards. Though Vader lifts his hands and intakes the power. And with a wave of his hands, he sends the Emperor through the wall. And I'll show you the true power, my master. Leaving the temple, Vader would call upon Krennic, ready the Death Star Director. Vader and the Grand Inquisitor would completely exit the Jedi Temple, and Vader would turn around, raising his hands, and the ground would begin to creak. Vader would pull the temple down on top of Sidious. The Jedi Temple that once stood was nothing but broken pillars and materials on top of one another, covering the remnants of the former Sith Temple and the remnants of the former Jedi Temple. Vader would tell the Grand Inquisitor and Krennic to reconvene on the Death Star. Vader takes a separate gunship to the Emperor's office and calls together the Imperial officers before they leave world. Vader would sit them down and tell them, The Emperor has no more power. Swear allegiance to me, or suffer the same fate as him. 
They knew Vader was powerful, but they never thought he'd just overthrow the Empire. Tarkin was skeptical. You've killed him. Vader turned. No. I'm going to show his true colors. And then, I will kill him. Kind of called over the hologram. Lord Vader, we await you. Vader would nod, saying that he'd be there momentarily. And Vader would respond to the rest of the Imperials. Look outside, and know the true power in the galaxy. The Imperials would follow Vader to his shuttle and see a large moon-sized space station over the city world. Vader's shuttle would leave and arrive on the space station. The Emperor who finally emerged from the rubble of the Jedi Temple would see what awaited above him. All of his work, all of his time building towards this moment, but the moment wasn't his. He built everything so that he could rule forever, but in that moment, realizing he built all of it for Vader. The Emperor requested a shuttle and arrived to find all of his subordinates in utter disbelief. Vader had turned them all against him. The Emperor would see, then, that every communication array on Coruscant emitted with Vader. He spoke softly. Your Emperor is weak. Your empire is soft with him needing it. I will bring forth a new era of galactic history. I shall defeat the Emperor in combat, and then you shall serve my new empire. The Emperor stands in shock as Vader's shuttle can be seen entering from the clouds towards the Senate platform. Kanek awaits his leader's commands. The shuttle lands, and before Vader can exit the shuttle, City sends a wave of the Force comes in. Vader leaps from the shuttle and lands with one hand. He reaches behind him and pulls the shuttle up and places it softly on the platform. Thrawn, Yularen, Tarkin, and the others step back, and camera droids capture the event and broadcast it across the Empire. Vader releases his shuttle and walks steadily towards the Emperor. Palpatine knows this is his final stand, a fight to the death, a fight for the Empire, a fight for his legacy. Two golden blades would slip down his sleeves as Skywalker makes his single blade. The two would clash in a fiery blaze, and the Empire across the galaxy would watch without movement. This battle could define the rule of the galaxy to which it would be subjected to. Vader looks Palpatine down and strikes ferociously at his former master. Your rule is at an end, my master. Palpatine grins, never. Swiping up, throwing Vader off balance, he hits Vader with the strongest wave of force lightning he can, sending Vader off the platform. Laughing, Palpatine readies himself for Vader's return. Vader jumps up from below and lands before Sidious. Now you will die. A wave of force push throws Palpatine to the ground and drags him across the platform, indenting the floor. Vader walks forward, raising his hands, pulling at Palpatine with Force Drain. The Dark Lord is no match for Vader's pure strength. Vader, though, doesn't want a decisive victory. He wants to torture Sidious. As Palpatine tries to stand to face Vader, he is weakened from the Force Drain. Vader lifts him with a Force Choke and brings him to Vader's hand. Vader holds Palpatine by the throat and pushes him towards the sky, championing what he is about to do before the galaxy. A red blade shines from Vader's side, and he decapitates the Emperor, letting the lifeless body fall to the ground. Vader grins. Come with me. As he motions to the Imperial officers, they all enter his shuttle and head for the Death Star. On the Death Star, Vader would seat the Imperials in a conference room. He would enter with Krennic and be referred to as Emperor by Tarkin. Vader would look at Tarkin, I am not your emperor. I will not let my ego affect my power. The dark side is where my power grows. Krennic would step forward. My lord, I suggest I lead the Imperial Senate. Vader would settle into his seat. You may decide what to do. We have complete power over the galaxy. I only seek knowledge. We have power. The Imperials would eventually select Krennic over Tarkin in fear of upsetting the clearly powerful Vader. Though Vader didn't care, Krennic would now be heading both the Imperial Senate and the Death Star. Vader would tell the Imperials that Grand Admiral Thrawn would station his fleet near the Death Star, and that any and all weaknesses would need to be eradicated. Vader also exclaimed that his two apprentices aboard the Death Star were not to be interfering with Imperial business. Their job was to train his many students. After being asked about where he was going, Vader told the Imperial Council that he was going to Exegol, 
to finish the remainder of his training, to learn everything there is to know about the true nature of the dark side. Rebels in the past few years have grown powerfully. With support from Mon Cala, they've assembled a fleet. Mon Cala's issue with the Empire isn't much deeper than being distraught that they didn't put their primary shipyards at Mon Cala, but in the previous 10 years there hasn't been much reason to dislike the Empire. Orson Krennic has been elected a second time and rules benevolently. Uh, Tarkin rather resents Krennic, but obeys because he's allowed to be the ruling moth at Iridu. Saw Gerrera and his band of terrorists have recently struck at a deep core imperial base killing many clone veterans um, and an inquisitor. Since Saw has been out trying to cause disability in the Empire, uh, Chancellor Krennic has tightened his grip on worlds that have shown rebellious ten tendencies, such as Lethal, Onderon, and Mon Cala. Uh, which are the primary planets with restrictions. Uh, because this doesn't drastically affect deep core, mid rim, and even outer rim worlds, the Senate agrees with the decision. On another note, the Empire has used its military efficiently by crushing all the crime fa families in the outer rim and establishing militaristic run operations. These operations are led by high ranking inquisitors and are ran well, and are liked by citizens by the outer rim. Though, it's important to note that Vader has told the Grand Inquisitor and his two apprentices, Barisophy and Pong Krell, that they and all those under them must obey the Moths. It wasn't because they were to be feared, but it was because, why force power when the galaxy already bends to your will? Vader, on the other hand, goes for years without being seen. Every so often he's seen venturing quietly through the Senate building, Death Star, or even Korriban. His apprentices have finished their training, but since Vader has no true threat, he spent most of his time on Exegol, doing what he wants. Vader has built a new Sith Temple, and established a cloning facility, but not for himself. He's been trying to manipulate the Force to create life, but without the help of another, much like Plagueis. Well, Vader has found the path to immortality, and even how to transfer his essence from one life form to another, he has no interest. He's already become the most powerful being in the galaxy. He hasn't eaten a planet, but he also hasn't grown a ravenous hunger for the Force. He's not a wound, but a creation of the Force. And though Vader doesn't see down the path of the Jedi, he also doesn't feel the need to go out and seize power from those he already has power from. Vader's younglings are the only ones who were consistently around Vader. They have come to age and are now full-grown adults. It's been more than 20 years since he took them from the Jedi Temple. Vader knew they would crush any Jedi that showed their face, but they were working with a group of dark side users that weren't powerful enough to use a force like the Sith. They were called the Prophets of the Dark Side. Vader was like a god to them. They built him a temple, and they built his cloning facility. Vader's cloning facility had a purpose. It wasn't for him, but for relics. Relics of the Sith. When he was seen on the Death Star, Coruscant, or Karaban, he was retrieving relics from all the Sith that he had studied. He wanted to use their remnants to bring them back. Why? Power. He could build the greatest Sith army ever, yes, but, but would the greatest Sith ever try to steal his power? Yes, of course, they were Sith. Vader, though, was ready to begin his first cloning test before he received a call from Chancellor Krennic. He was rather annoyed, but answered it because, of course, he did put Krennic in power and in the place to see it at first. Krennic told Vader that the last Jedi had been discovered, and there was someone else who worked with them, someone who wanted revenge for a decade. General Grievous was now fighting for the rebels. Vader thought this would be a waste of time, but he could finally finish what Palpatine couldn't, what no Sith had ever done. Vader didn't want to live forever, but he did want his legacy to be that of the most powerful Sith in history. Vader departed Exegol and returned to his flagship. There he was greeted by several Sith he had trained, but some he had never met. 
Vader decided that he would let his apprentices from Exegol join him, though he was very, very wary of the prophets of the dark side that remained behind. A true Sith army was being dispatched to Lothal, where there was a massive rebel fleet amassed. Vader's fleet emerged from hyperspace. Grand Admiral Thrawn was told to join the battle, as the Death Star would be dropped out of hyperspace near Lothal shortly. The space battle began, with Vader's Super Star Destroyer shelling Mon Calamari flagships. They were caught off guard. There was nothing that could really stop Vader and Thrawn's feet combined. Vader communicated to Thrawn to begin the ground deployment. Vader entered a fighter and his apprentices and inquisitors got into their advanced ties and guided the Imperial shuttles to the ground. Skywalker decided for some fun, spinning and broke off from the group of Imperials. This was the fight the Rebellion needed to win, but they, they were outmatched. Vader tore through the shields of cruisers and obliterated squadrons of fighters. Vader was unstoppable. He was the best pilot in the galaxy. All of his powers were so amplified that he was literally unstoppable, and maybe even that arrogance got the best of him. On the ground, ATTE walkers landed, and they were followed closely by ATAT walkers. The rebels had several hovering tanks, and they met the walkers with stiff resistance. It was an all out war. Veers led from a personalized ATTE, while Thrawn led on an assault on the ground from the city. Barris and Pong kept close to Thrawn, while Vader's apprentices ravaged through rebel forces. They eventually crossed paths with Jedi, and their battle began with a line of duels, where a Jedi fell, a Sith fell. Troopers came in with support while Thrawn watched with pleasure. On the plains, rebel forces were being crushed hastily by Imperial units. Vader had enough of his toying around and landed behind the enemy lines near the Jedi Temple. He left his shuttle and lifted his cloak above his head and walked towards the temple. In the city, the Jedi began to get slaughtered. It wasn't their best nights, but they did some harm to some of si <clears throat> But they did their harm to some of Vader's younglings, who had grown into great warriors in their first true test of combat. The plains battle was full of sit and ash, and from the rebel destruction rose a single Jedi. The Grand Inquisitor halted his troops and stepped before them and his Inquisitors. The Jedi Knight Kyle Katarn stood before him. The Grand Inquisitor hadn't much to say and ignited his blade for a true fight. As the two clashed, blades blue and red shone through the rebel. The Grand Inquisitor in his age was in far more than he thought he was and his arrogance bested him. He was pushed to the ground and instead of Kyle killing him, he felt a disturbance. The Temple. He left a defeated Inquisitor on the ground as the Grand Inquisitor gathered himself. Together, the Seven Sister ignited her blade into his back. Taking command of the Inquisitors, she led them to follow Kyle. The Imperial Army stopped and allowed the Sith to fight the Jedi. It wasn't their fight, and it wasn't their duty to finish the job for the Sith, so they prepared to return to their ships. Admiral Radis's flagship had been destroyed and blast from the Death Star turned home one, Admiral Akbar's ship, to pieces of metal floating in space. A full and complete victory all across the board. Anakin was incredible with a lightsaber, skilled beyond belief, powerful without a hint of weakness. Anakin moved like a blur, cutting through dozens of Jedi at a time. The small order had been built from nothing, and the remaining few hundred Jedi were now dying instantaneously. The Inquisitors arrived and stopped as they met Barris and Pong and the other apprentices. They watched, as did Kyle. He couldn't move. Skywalker was unstoppable. Another two Jedi, one with a broken neck, and the other in two halves. They were all Padawans or Knights, and sadly, they had to face Vader. This was an ego boost for sure, but Anakin did not let that go to his mind. He turned to see three more Jedi running at him, and let a wave of force lightning evaporate their flesh as they groaned on the floor in pain, dying, withering away. Vader turned and saw another few Jedi. They moved away from him. They knew it was over. They tried to run, but Vader's use of the force was unmatched. He stopped them with the force and then drained their entire being. He did this with one hand. Pulling a lightsaber back out, he winged it across the hall, cutting the Jedi down. Vader moved quietly without beating his chest as he came across the first master in the Order, Kanan Jarrus. Their duel commenced, and it was a true match of blades. Vader wanted to toy around with the Jedi, but then his apprentice came. Kanan called to Ezra, telling him to stay back, but it wasn't enough. Vader pulled Ezra with the force and grabbed him by the throat. Kanan harnessed the dark side to try and save his apprentice, and Vader smiled. He threw Ezra aside and focused on Kanan, mocking him, telling him that it gave him power and made him stronger. 
and telling him that all this time he could have joined Vader. Cutting Kanan down and then feeling a pain in his back, Ezra slashed Vader across the back. Vader was impressed, but it wasn't worth the effort. He sees Ezra's life essence and replenished the pain in his back, using force heal on himself and force drain on Ezra. Kyle, Coda, and the remaining 40 Jedi, which most of were masters, surrounded Anakin Skywalker. He knew that if he didn't act, he would be killed. So Vader knelt down as they approached, all ready to strike him down. Vader grinned. He picked them all up with the Force, and instead of killing them, he used Force Sever against the Jedi. Now he could torture them for eternity. They all fell to the ground as they tried to rise. They all at once collectively felt something different. They could no longer utilize the Force. They were nothing but normal beings, disconnected from the Force. It didn't stop the few who tried to fight for their lives, the few who were struck down by Vader, one by one. One of the Inquisitors tried to strike down the Jedi, but were stopped by Vader. Without a beat, he crushed the windpipe of the Inquisitor, and they fell to the ground. Vader turned to the Inquisitors and told them that he would be taking the Jedi to Exegol until they became extinct. The rebellion was crushed, and he told them to return to serving the Empire. Skywalker put his cloak back over his head and walked away, through the rubble of dead bodies he had created on his way in. Before anyone could speak, purge troopers came in and took the Jedi, cuffing them one by one and putting them into shuttles back to Vader's flagship. If they resisted, they were killed. Now on the Death Star, a small group of rebels had breached the hangar bay led by Saul Guerrero. Pong and Barris were dispatched specifically by Darth Vader to kill them. Their opportunity to shine once again after beating the Jedi on the Thal's capital. They landed on the Death Star and ripped the rebels limb from limb. The Imperial troopers in the hangar bay held stiff resistance, but the two apprentices of Vader's finished off the rebel insurgents. Upon Vader's return to Exegol, he felt a disturbance, not the Jedi, but something within his temple. The prophets wouldn't turn on him, would they? He hadn't foreseen this betrayal, but upon his arrival, it was true. As he landed amongst the waste, he watched blades clash with blades and prophets running. It was war, not just any war, the greatest war in the history of the Sith. All those relics he had acquired from his training, they were used to bring life to the Sith of the past, and they were creating a war upon each other. So much raw power at Vader's disposal. The most powerful beings in galactic history stood before him, warring for their rightful power in the galaxy. Vader saw coming before him, though, an apparition of Palpatine, but he had no time for his folly. Vader cut down Palpatine once again and made his way towards a brute of a Sith Lord, Sion. Vader's duel began with Lord Sion, but before any final blows could be dealt, Darth Treya came along to assist her former apprentice. For Anakin, three blades of Treya were no assignment, nor was facing Sion, but then he felt the presence of a Dark Lord approaching their combat. It was the Lord of Hunger. The deadliest trio of the Sith was now facing down the full power of Lord Vader. This was the truest test of Vader's ability, and this was the truest test since he fought the Jedi Council all those years ago on Coruscant. Vader, though, was like a blur. He moved at incredible speed, knocking down two of Treya's blade before he found himself striking blades with Sion, who towered over Anakin physically. Anakin took advantage of Sion's overconfidence, bringing his blade into Sion's chest, and then using Sion's blade to stab Treya in the left eye. The two Sith dropped lifelessly. Vader felt a pull. Nihilus abandoned the duel and started using Force Drain on Skywalker. Vader felt the essence of Force leaving his body, draining him to his knees before he turned the Lord of Hunger against himself by taking all of the Force essence from Nihilus and draining the Dark Lord until a cloak and a mask fell to the floor without a body. Of course, Nihilus being a wound in the Force could corrupt Anakin's Force being, but Vader had no fear of this. The battle raged on. Vader would come to strike down Melek and find himself at a crossroads of the power of Revan and Bastilla, who stood before him. Vader respected the duo, but Vader had enough of history coming to life. Extending his blade, he clashed hard against Revan. Purple and red was a sight to behold, but it didn't last, and neither did Bastilla. The great battle in Exegol taught Vader not to trust the prophets. He soon slaughtered the rest of them that were still alive, mercilessly and painfully, breaking bones, removing limbs, before he finished the kill. This was nothing compared to what he would do to the Jedi in due time. 
Imperial troopers were brought in at the request of Chancellor Krennic, and Vader's temple was rebuilt. It was a training ground for Sith, but also a laboratory. Vader would eventually create his first life. Down the road, Vader could create life as he pleased, and the Sith ruled the galaxy. The Death Star was always at his command, but the Empire ran smoother than the Republic, and any hint of the Jedi was reduced to ash. It was not that Vader was weak, but he had achieved power, and he was already the most powerful being in the galaxy, in the history of the galaxy, ever. Vader could foresee an apprentice attempting to kill him, or a coup within the Empire. Anything that could have affected him negatively, he could prevent instantaneously. Vader taught all of his lessons to Pong Krell. He was a worthy apprentice, and he was worthy of such knowledge. Barriss was too ignorant to lead the Sith down a path of victory, but Krell had manipulated the Jedi for long enough, and he was more capable of being the Sith to succeed Vader, though this wouldn't happen for another several decades. The story of Vader ends with the galaxy subservient to the Empire and with the Sith throughout the galaxy having achieved what it is that the Sith had always wanted, true power. Vader had achieved the goal and now had a powerful Sith Order subservient to him and him alone. The galaxy would find itself in peace and as Anakin reached his full potential, he continued to embrace himself in the Force, studying and experimenting, discovering new abilities and new powers as he was unstoppable. After Anakin's death, the legacy of all who fell before him or to him vanished, as the galaxy would find itself bowing to a new Sith leader. Wow, our four-part series is finally over, guys. I really hope you guys enjoyed this. I spent a lot of time on these. I hope you guys, like, this is really cool. I don't know. I don't know. What do you guys think? Tell me what you guys think down below about where we got, where we got at the end of this series. Honestly, didn't expect it to go this far when I started so many months ago. I didn't even expect it to be as popular as it was so many months ago. So I'm so glad you guys really enjoyed this uh, series. It's gonna be like an hour long movie, so I hope you guys got your popcorn for the movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I honestly, once once Maul and Savage are out of the picture and Anakin having spent so much time with the Sith, I think it's reasonable that he would have become so powerful. And not only that, but he wasn't nearly as arrogant as the other Sith. He just wasn't. He just, I mean, growing up with the Sith, yeah, he could have been, but he also was a slave at some point and he did have resentment towards uh, Palpatine for that. So in some way, shape or form, Anakin would have probably been a better Sith than any Sith ever. He would have probably been a gray Sith, if we're going to call it that, like the gray Jedi version of a Sith. Uh, but he really would have be vying for power. He already had all the power he needed. He could he could seize control the galaxy with a snap of the finger. So, I mean, I don't really see Vader vying for power. What happens after this is up to your imagination. Just like any good Star Wars movie, it's up to you to imagine what happens in our favorite galaxy far, far away. In my mind, I like to imagine that uh, there will be a power fight for the, the leader of the Sith. I feel like Pong and Barris would get into a big duel, and then whoever won would control the galaxy, but not control it like how Vader did it, and it would just kind of be a mess. Um, but I hope you guys did enjoy this. As always, spread the love, uh, subscribe if you want to win a free lightsaber, and I will see you guys in the next video. And always remember, may the Force be with you. <laughs>